the 10th Annual Betty Ann and Wayne Peggy Lecture in Integrated Medicine. And uh, to uh, do the introduction for that, I'd like to welcome back uh, Dean Preston Smith. Betty Ann and Wade Heggie Lectureship in Integrated Medicine. I uh, certainly thrilled to see the turnout this morning. The, uh, the lecture was started in 2005 for this purpose, to support the costs of lectures and or other delivery methods to provide continuing edu education opportunities for faculty, residents, and practitioners in the field of complementary and alternative medicine. The lecture exists in perpetual perpetuity. I knew I wouldn't be able to say that. Um, it brings high-profile, knowledgeable, and experienced physicians to our college to address current topics in complementary and integrative medicine. So integrative medicine, it reaffirms the importance of the relationship between the practitioner and the patient. It focuses on the whole person, it is informed by evidence, and it makes use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals, and disciplines to achieve op optimal health and healing. It's now a board certified medical specialty and it's taught in virtually every medical school in Canada and the United States. And certainly I'm proud of the curriculum that we have here at the U of S. Uh, Betty Ann, about the Haggies. Betty Ann and Wade Haggie have both been prominent members of the business, volunteer, and philanthropic communities in this province for many years. Wade has been involved in aviation, life insurance, and financial planning, and has helped prominent volunteer roles with several community-based organizations. Betty Ann has had an illustrious career as a senior executive in corporate relations in the potash industry, and has had held numerous directorships in the public and private sector. The Haggies have been wonderful supporters of the University of Saskatchewan, and have also provided tremendous volunteer assistance in the attracting of other donors to the University of Saskatchewan. Wade and Betty have both had extensive personal experience in leading integrated health centers throughout North America. So this lectureship, created through their gift to College of Medicine, is their way of articulating their vision for integrated medicine in this province. And I think uh, Dee Dee said this is the first time in 10 years that they haven't been able to be here. Uh, certainly uh, uh, um, represented, I think, in uh, Dee Dee Maltman and her family uh, here today. But, uh, but um, they would really love to be here. About our speaker, Dr. Stephen Genuins. In, in just a few moments, we have the privilege of hearing from the 2017 Heggie lecturer, Dr. Stephen Genuins, whose topic is the clinical practice of environmental medicine. Dr. Genuins is a clinician and researcher involved in many areas of medical science. He's a board certified. He's, he's certified in obstetrics and gynecology as well as in environmental medicine. Practices uh, in, at, at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. He's, he's authored over 110 scientific publications for over 50 different peer-reviewed medical journals. He lectures extensively and has reviewed papers for over 70 different scientific and medical publications. He holds a commemorative medal from the Governor General in recognition of significant contribution to Canada. In addition, in addition to all of that, he enjoys ballroom dancing with his wife Sheila, being pa to his five children, and opa to his five grandchildren. Please join me in a warm welcome for our 10th Betty Ann and Wade Heggie lecturer, Dr. Stephen Genuis. Dean Smith, thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here today and to have the opportunity to to chat with you. I am most grateful to the people at the Center for Integrated Medicine. It was wonderful to meet you last night and to chat. I have such admiration for what you're doing and all that you've accomplished. I also want to thank the Heggie family for providing the opportunity to be able to do this. Um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the clinical practice of environmental medicine. What I'd like to do is to divide it into two sections. The first section I'd like to talk a little bit about the background, and I want to talk about the problem of chronic disease. And then I want to go into the clinical aspects of environmental medicine um, to talk about practical aspects. So let me first of all 
begin to talk a bit about the challenge. Most of us are most grateful to live in Canada and to have a wonderful healthcare system. It's often considered the fundamental pillar of our national identity, and a recent survey found that 90% of Canadians consider healthcare to be the main priority for decision makers, and that it's preserving our healthcare system is even more important than any other issue, including the environment and the economy. But what many people don't realize is that the healthcare system is often thought by many to be in a position of crisis. If we look at the expenditures, they have skyrocketed over the last couple of decades. And the rise in costs far exceed population growth and economic growth and inflation. And many people now consider it to, to be unsustainable. If we look, our healthcare expenditure is the leading expenditure for every province, approximating 50% uh, in, in most provinces. But what's astonishing is despite unprecedented amount of resources expended, and the fact now that we have more MDs per population in Canada than ever before, the availability of services appears to be declining. We have more and more people who are unable to find a family doctor. We have longer waiting lists. People have difficulty with access in various regions of the country. There's often prolonged waiting lists in emergency departments and so on. There have been calls from many sources to address to fix the healthcare system. For example, a recent president of the Canadian Medical Association said that we have a moral imperative to fix the healthcare system and the time for action is now. Recognizing the challenge of sustainability, there have been a number of commissions, a number of groups, a number of economists that have met all kinds of panels that have produced reports. In Alberta, we had the Mazankowski report. And we've had attempts by federal and provincial ministers. One of the recent prime ministers talks about fixing health care for a generation. It has been a leading issue in almost every federal election. Yet, the problem with unsustainable costs continues to rise, and the decline in availability of services continues. And so what I'd ask you to consider today, what I'm going to propose, is that a primary factor that's leading to the escalating healthcare challenge has not been adequately addressed and has not been adequately explored, and many people are not aware of it. And this is what's being described in the medical literature as the rapidly escalating and often neglected problem of chronic disease. The editor of The Lancet, one of the top three journals in the world, talked about rising rates at profound epidemic of chronic disease. If we look at North America, for example, you know, chronic disease now is accounting for more than 85% of healthcare costs, and over half of the American population now has at least one chronic condition. And more than one in four has multiple chronic conditions. If we look at 3Ds, for example, diabetes. In the 1890s, when Sir William Osler wrote his book on the principles and practices of medicine, the incidence of diabetes was about one in 50,000. Now it's about 7% of the population, and a lot of that has been a profound rise in the last 20 years. If we look at mental health problems, when I went to medical school, I was taught that, you know, one in 20 Canadians will develop mental health problems. I was recently at a conference where a psychiatrist from New York was talking about the figures now in the United States, that it's about one in four Americans and rising. And a couple of weeks ago, WHO came out indicating that depression is now the leading cause of disability worldwide. Dementia has been increasing at a rapid rate, so much so that the head of the Alzheimer's Association said that the number of people affected with Alzheimer's and dementia is growing at an epidemic pace, and the skyrocketing financial and personal costs will devastate the world's economies and healthcare systems. Now, when this kind of information is presented, sometimes people respond by saying, but that's to be expected. We have an aging population. But well, my friends, a lot of the pandemic of chronic disease is happening in children. And JAMA, they recently had an article entitled The Increase in Childhood Chronic Conditions in the United States. And they say that health and social welfare systems are unprepared for the rapid growth 
the demands that will arise from these epidemics. So we see at the more mature stages of life, but as well as at the young stages of life, people are expressing concern about rising rates of disease and the impact on the healthcare system. Let's look at autism, for example. In 1975, it was a relatively uncommon disease. It about 1 in 5,000 is published in Nature. The most recent official statistics is it's gone up thousands of percent, and that was 1 in 68 in the U.S. People sometimes think it's because of improved diagnosis and an expanding definition as a spectrum disorder. And the epidemiology world has looked at that, and they said, yeah, it's absolutely true, and that accounts for a small percentage, but it doesn't account for the multiple thousands of percent increase in this condition. If we look at pediatric mental health, in Canada, half of the pediatric hospital beds are now filled with children and teenagers to treat mental health problems. In the USA, if we look for visits for bipolar, over the last number of years, they've increased more than 40-fold. If we look at children with cancer in September in the UK, there was a children with cancer conference. They talked about an incredible rise of 40% over the last while, particularly in teenagers. It's not only in, in children, of course. A couple of days ago, there was the announcement in Canada from the Canadian Cancer Society that nearly half of all Canadians now are expected to be diagnosed with some form of cancer. And the World Health Organization came out with a World Cancer Report stating that they anticipate that this increase is going to continue with an anticipated 50% increase in rates of cancer over the next 15 years. We're seeing rising rates of chronic pain. Trying to get into a chronic pain clinic, people often are waiting for over a year even to be assessed. Okay, we're seeing teenagers now with chronic pain. And as well, we're seeing all kinds of unexplained illnesses, people with fibromyalgia, with chronic fatigue, in one of Canadian province, they recently formed a task force that I was asked to be on with a claim that they have over half a million people with unexplained environmental illnesses that are consuming enormous amounts of healthcare dollars. So my friends, of course these are not just statistics. These are real people who are suffering, right? Who have a decreased quality of life, who have um, functional decline. We have a, a crisis of disability. I recently was speaking at an autism conference and there was a number of physicians there who themselves had children with autism. And one of them who gave a talk said that every day in the U.S. 50 autistic children are now becoming adults. That the levels now are increasing, increasing disability rates. And she was saying, you know, I'm a single mom looking after my son but I'm getting older and I can support him now. Who's going to care for him? So we see the impact on families. And of course, the impact on society with a greater demand for health services and escalating health care. Right? Now, in response, when I chat with people sometimes about this crisis, often the response will be, but, you know, if you sit back, we have better health care than ever before. And we have health, healthier people than ever before, don't we? And look at the life expectancy. And life expectancy figures are often given to, to with this impression that we have a healthier population. And often people will give these figures, and it's a very legitimate question. If we look at the 1900s, for example, the life expectancy of both men and women was in the 40s. And if you look at 2014, the life expectancy for both is in the 80 range. Surely that huge rise in life expectancy would suggest that we have a healthier population that's healthier than ever before. But if we unpack these stats and we look at them, what is life expectancy? It simply is the average age of death. Right? And the huge rise in life expectancy over the last century has predominantly been because of a dramatic decline in infant mortality. You know, a century ago, they often would start keeping statistics at age one because there was such a high infant mortality. It's declined by over 90%. So if we look at somebody who dies at 90 and another who dies at 80, we add them up, 170 divided by two, and life expectancy is 85. But if we have somebody who dies at 90 in a neonatal death, 
then it's 90 plus 0 divided by 2, and life expectancy is 45. So if you start removing all those zeros from the equation, of course you have a massive bump up, right? And so we've seen a huge rise in life expectancy because of the phenomenal improvement in care for infants. If you want to really look at life expectancy, we could look at it from age 60 forward. And over the last 60 years or so, in both men and women, the rise in life expectancy has been about five years. And the hugest contribution to that, of course, has been phenomenal advances in acute care. Trauma care, cardiac events, managing of infectious diseases, our management of acute illness is incredible and unprecedented. The challenge is lying with the neglected epidemic of chronic disease. So what's causing all this problem and the rise in rates of illness? Well, let's look at the way we manage chronic illness. If we look at a lot of the clinical practice guidelines for people coming in with all kinds of illnesses, so we assess the patient to history, physical, appropriate investigations, we assign a diagnosis, and then we often commence treatment with medicine, and sometimes surgery, surgery if necessary. And many people then are using interventions to try to cope with their illness for the rest of their life. For example, if somebody comes in and they have symptoms that are suggestive of bipolar illness, we do an assessment, they, we get a diagnosis, and then interventions consistent with clinical practice guidelines are commenced. If somebody has a bone density and found to have osteoporosis, right? We use the diagnosis and appropriate interventions are commenced at that time. What about the etiology of bipolar illness? What about the etiology of rheumatoid arthritis? What about the etiology, the underlying cause of these illnesses? The actual etiology is often not explored. Surely, if there was a corruptible causation, we would be investigating it and trying to address it. But there's often a fundamental assumption in the way that we approach chronic illness. And this general algorithm of assessment, diagnosis, and treatment often presumes that the underlying etiology or cause is not readily explainable. And it's often assumed to be genetic. You know, we have this bad luck hypothesis that we are these, you know, uh, uh, hapless victims. Make a long story short, let's look at what some of the major medical institutions throughout the world are saying. Center for Disease Control recently came out with a fact statement. I'll quote, virtually all human diseases result from the interaction of genetic susceptibility. Yes, so our genes predispose us, they're very important, but it's the interaction with modifiable environmental factors, unquote. The National Institute of Health, another major organization, well respected throughout the world, major research body. Again, I'll quote them directly. Nearly all diseases result from a complex interaction between an individual's genetic makeup and the environmental agents that he or she is exposed to." Unquote. So what has been realized is that this genetic predestination paradigm is incomplete. And so our fixed genome does not predestine us to illness. That the environmental factors and these environmental determinants that in fact are modifiable, that can be changed, which is very hopeful, are interacting with our genes. And in fact, a recent pub there's a number of publications, but this most a recent one published in Science reviewed the findings and now indicates that 70 to 90 percent of chronic disease is primarily related to environmental determinants interacting with our genes. And even diseases that are, have been thought to be genetic, it's being found that various environmental determinants are, have the potential to alter DNA function. Many are acting through epigenetics, where they're not altering the DNA code, but they're controlling gene expression and regulation. So they're turning genes on and off. So the environmental component of etiology to chronic illness has increased dramatically. And it appears that this is where a lot of the etiology of illness is. But my friends, 
I have three children that over the last few years graduated from two different medical schools. They didn't even learn about what environmental determinants are. So how can they look for causation of disease and help patients who have chronic illness if they're not trained? In a recent study published in Public Library, uh, Public Library of Science, looked at this question directly and they found that most, it's rare for clinicians these days to be asking about environmental exposures and the majority of them said it, it's, it's not because they're not open to it but they just haven't been trained and so they don't have the skills in order to do this. And so we've begun to see faculties and departments of environmental health sciences beginning to open up in some major universities and Department of Stedricks, you know, in the University of uh, a University in California. Now they have residency training in this. Okay. So in the first half, what have we said thus far? That there's an increasing problem with chronic disease. Second, it's having a significant impact on individuals and society. Three, that environmental determinants have been identified as primary causes of the chronic disease epidemic. And finally medical trainees currently lack education in environmental determinants of disease. So now I'd like to move into a more clinical uh, approach to discuss an environmental medicine approach to clinical practice. So what does this look like? So if we say then that, you know, as CDC said, that virtually all human diseases result from this interaction between a fixed genome and a modifiable environment, and we can't do anything to change people's predisposition to disease, but we can do stuff to the modifiable environment. So what environmental medicine is then, is investigating and managing modifiable environmental determinants in this environmental realm to prevent health problems and to promote recovery and restoration for those who have chronic illness. So, this is a big topic, and there are various environmental determinants. We don't have time to go into all of them today, but I'll just talk a little bit about chemical exposures um, as just an example of this, and I'll tell you where you can get further information if this is something that, that you'd like to learn more about. Let's begin by talking about cigarette smoking. Okay. Everyone in the room knows that there's increased risk for all kinds of diseases, cardiac disease, respiratory disease, all kinds of cancers with increased exposure to cigarette smoke. But, but what is it about smoking that causes the problem? It's not because we're putting something in your mouth. It's because you're directly inhaling into your body various toxic agents. So, for example, in cigarette smoke, there's a lot of cadmium. Cadmium is a persistent metal in the body. Its half-life is very long. It's a carcinogen, well recognized. Benzene is another thing that's found in cigarette smoke. Again, a persistent lipophilic chemical stores in various uh, tissues. Carcinogens. <coughs> so if you have carcinogens that are persisting in your body, then you're at increased risk for developing the outcome of what those things are recognized to do, which is to cause cancer and suppress immune function. So we all recognize that. And we all take enormous efforts to try to encourage people not to smoke. That's well accepted. But it's the bioaccumulation of these toxic agents in the body that is causing the etiology of this problem. But my friends, in the last 50 to 60 years, we've had a chemical revolution, which has resulted in the production of tens of thousands of man-made chemicals that have been created and released into the environment that people are breathing, eating, it's in soil, sometimes in the water. It's part of daily life. Now, many of these chemicals are totally harmless. They come in and they leave. But some of the chemicals, like what's in cigarette smoke, are persistent. They get into the body. They reabsorb in the enterohepatic circulation. Many of, well, some of them are lipophilic, means they're attracted to fat tissues. So the brain is fattiest organ in the body, so some will accumulate in the brain. Thyroids, like it's fatty, so some will accumulate in thyroid and pancreas, so depending on the nature of the chemical. And these, some of these persistent agents 
like the agents in cigarette smoke, persist in bioaccumulating. And some of these agents are just as bad or worse than what's found in cigarette smoke. Right? So I could give you dozens of examples of various pesticides. Now they're being recognized to be really toxic. Perfluorinated compounds that are often used like in scotch garden carpets, and Teflon. Um, they're extremely persistent chemicals that can cause all kinds of health problems. There's flame, retar flame retardants and many more. Is this my idea? My friends, there's tons of stuff on this in the literature. The Center for Disease Control just recently updated their figures in 2017. This is the document that's online. I invite you to look at it. Okay, they've been, they've been studying the U.S. population, looking at these persistent chemicals and the levels in people in the United States. And Health Canada has begun to do it in Canada as well. And what have they found? Not that it's the exception, but it's the rule. And they've concluded that most American adults and children have bioaccumulated accumulated numerous toxic chemicals. Okay. Now, the initial thinking was, okay, well, it's no big deal. The levels are relatively low. You know, they're in parts per billion. But with ongoing study, it was re recognized that some of these levels are enormously potent. For example, if we look at our own human biochemistry, so I studied in obstetrics and gynecology. So I'll just tell you, in a woman's reproductive cycle, her level of free estradiol, the estrogen, which is controlling her reproduction, her sexuality, and so on, right? Depending on where you are in the cycle is from 0 0.0006 to 0 0.0071 parts per billion. Pretty small amounts, right? Like we're talking a, a drop in a, in a lake the amounts are so small. But we're finding some very potent hormonally active chemicals that are hundreds and thousands of times higher in people's bodies. And as one article published not so long ago talks about the large effects from these small exposures. Now some people want, you know, are interested in well, what do these chemicals actually do when they get into the body? Well, uh, we had a paper just published a couple weeks ago in a toxicology journal uh, on my colleagues and myself exploring and reviewing the literature about all the mechanisms identified. And some of these agents alter genetic function. Some induce genetic mutations. Some are directly cytotoxic to cells. Some destroy and alter mitochondrial function. Some produce inflammation. Some induce autoimmune changes. Some, uh, you know, some are with regards to neurological disease, it's now been found that MS and ALS, for example, appear to be related to what's called reactive nitrogen species. There's one particular one called peroxynitrite. It's been found that various toxic agents are inducing the formation of this peroxynitrite. So if you're interested, the paper is online at our website. You're most welcome to look at it about the mechanisms. But let me give a concrete example to put a face on this. And then we'll begin to talk about what can actually be done clinically. One group of chemicals is called brominated flame retardants. They're it's called polybrominated dienylphen, that ethers, okay? PBDEs, we affectionately refer to them. These are fire retardants, and they are used all over the place. But the most common place and the biggest source of exposure are people's mattresses. In the 1950s and 60s, when televisions became ubiquitous, and people started smoking in bed, lying in bed watching television, people would fall asleep watching. Cigarettes would burn the beds, beds would catch on fire, people got burned, houses burned down, and so on. So governments instituted a law that all mattresses, because of the highly flammable polyurethane foam, had to uh, uh, respect a certain standard that they set for not catching fire. And in order to do that, they had to soak the beds with these flame retardants, these PBDEs. Okay? In order to maintain the standard, they were about 25 to 30% by weight, these toxic chemicals. But it wasn't known about the toxicity at that time. So every night as people slept in their beds, 
and were against their pillow that were often made from the same foam material that was doused with these flame retardants, they would be inhaling PBDEs for seven or eight hours every night. Children in their cribs. I don't know how many children smoke, but in their wisdom, they also you know, treated infants at cribs. And so what happened? Well, if you look at recent studies on the levels, the blood levels of these PBDEs over the last few decades, they've skyrocketed because they recycle, they bioaccumulate, they're lipophilic, they store in tissues, and they're persistent. They have a long half-life in the body. Right? And I will tell you, it's recently been found that these serum levels are only a fraction of the amount that people have in their bodies because the body tries to defend itself and it puts them into tissues to get them out of the circulation where they're most potent. So this is only a glimpse of that stored in the brain and in the, in the thyroid and the adrenal and so on. But recently, over the last 10 years, there has been extensive uh, exploration of what these things actually do in the body. And there's tons of literature on this talk, and they found direct correlations with diabetes, dementia, neurodevelopmental problems. Just like cigarettes causing a whole host of problems, we're now beginning to see what these flame retardants that are in most people are causing. They're, they're hormone disruptors. They're causing infertility. They're causing some cancers. They're causing thyroid disease. How would they cause thyroid disease? Well, by a mechanism called endocrine disruption. It's being found that many chemicals are EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they can interfere with the synthesis, the transport, the action, or the excretion of hormones. They can mimic hormones. For example, these ones are estrogen units. Some are anti-estrogen. Right? And these many chemicals are what are called endocrine disruptors. They can affect fertility, thyroid function, puberty. They can affect sexual indices and development. And various organs, like breast, are hormone sensitive, as is prostate and endometrium. Okay. But it's not just these PBDEs. If we look at thyroid disruption, I mean, thyroid disease has gone up very, very substantially late. All kinds of chemicals have been found to be etiological agent disrupting thyroid function. You know, some plastics are binding thyroid hormone receptors. Some are binding, you know, other chemicals, certain pesticides and PCBs interfere with TSH receptors. Some inter induce thyroid antibodies, other chemicals, you know, alter ID metabolism, and on and on it goes. By many different mechanisms, a whole slew of chemicals can interfere with thyroid disease. Okay, so what can we do about this from an environmental medicine perspective? Well, let's look at any disease, okay? If we take a person who's healthy and we introduce them to a cause, environmental genetic combination, what does it do? It alters their chem biochemistry and it induces a pathophysiology. That's the abnormal process, the process of illness. The disease is simply the manifestation. It's the effect. It's the label that we give to it. So if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis or whatever, they have abnormal biochemistry that has been caused by something. The cause, or the root cause, is simply what takes healthy biochemistry and converts it into abnormal biochemistry, which then manifests in our diagnosis. So if we talk about intervening, what are the possibilities? Well, we can intervene in the biochemical process, or we can intervene in the etiology, or we can intervene in both. So typically, what's often done with our current clinical practice guidelines is we have people with diseases, and we know we may do testing and find their biochemistry is altered, and we use interventions, medications, sometimes supplements, to try to overcome their biochemical change to make them feel better. right? And if we assume that disease is genetic, that's all we have. But in environmental medicine, we have a little bit of a different approach. Yes, we believe in doing investigations to find out where the altered biochemistry is. But we don't want to leave it there. We now have the ability to do assessments and investigations on people 
to look for the underlying etiology of the problem. So when we're assessing people with chronic illness, as well as addressing their biochemistry to mitigate harm and to diminish suffering, we're also at the same time looking for what's causing this altered biochemistry in the first place. Okay? So let me put a face on this. I just took one example from the medical literature of a case. So here is a 60-year-old gentleman who had multimorbidity been suffering for quite a while. He was an insulin-dependent diabetic. He had various neurological problems. He had environmental work. And they did an assessment for etiology. And they found that he was loaded with PCBs. Okay, PCBs. Now, people think, well, that's they've been banned in the 70s. And so why, why would that be an issue now? When I investigate people, I find them all the time because they're persistent agents. They pass uh, you know, prenatally by vertical transmission from mother to child. So I've, and in certain parts of the world, if people travel, you know, they may acquire them or they're still being used. So this is not an uncommon. We find all kinds of chemicals in people. So in this gentleman, yes, his biochemistry was addressed to relieve symptoms with insulin and so on. But then he was treated with an agent that binds the PCBs, interrupts the enterohepatic circulation so they don't reabsorb and eliminates them in the stool from the body. So he was treated with these. His level went from 3,200 milligrams to kilogram over a number of months down to 56. His diabetes went away. Became normal glycemic, off insulin, resolution of other symptoms with marked clinical improvement. It also is very effective for prevention and educating our population about how to be healthy. I'm going to just give you an example with Alzheimer's, which we have said is going up dramatically and causing all kinds of illness. Now, as we all agree, there's tons of stuff in the medical literature with regards to exercise and the phenomenal benefits of exercise with regards to cancer, heart disease, all kinds of things, right? That's well known. Exercise induces mitochondrial biogenesis and all kinds of wonderful things that have been found. Another thing that's kind of interesting is it's been found just like exercise is a natural mechanism for helping with and preventing all kinds of illness, that's why I encourage it, that sweating is a natural way to eliminate a lot of chemicals. And it's an inherent, you know, God-designed thing where we're able to dump a lot of chemicals by use of mobilization through the skin. And there's a number of papers in the literature now that have examined sweating and the chemicals that come out. So not everything comes out, but many chemicals do. And just to give you a paper that recently came out that highlights this, this is looking at, this is looking at uh, sweating um, through sauna. In Finland, it's a very common cultural practice to sauna. So this was a paper that was published, I believe, in September, just recently. And what they did is they looked in Finland at three groups. It's a large study, okay, over 2,000 men, close to 2,500 men and they follow them for over 20 years on average. So this isn't some short, brief you know, uh, sample, it's a huge sample. And what they found, they looked at people who sauntered once a week, those who sauntered uh, two to three times a week, and those who sauntered four to seven times a week, right? So the more you sweat, the more you're eliminating chemicals from your body. And they found that compared to those who sauntered once a week, those who sauntered four to seven times a week, it was a 66% decline in developing dementia. That's profound, profound. And so now, so this is one of the modalities that we use depending on which agents we find in you. Okay. Now where this is particularly a problem, um, and uh, as an obstetrician I'm going to mention this, is vertical transmission from mother to child, right? FIGO, the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a couple of years ago came out and released a special communication saying that exposure to toxic environmental chemicals during pregnancy and breastfeeding is everywhere and it's now a threat to human reproduction. And they talked about what a serious problem it is, trying to alert the medical community throughout the world. Because a lot of these chemicals now are passing to children in utero and it's being found that they are the cause of a lot of pediatric disease and now there are fetal origins of adult disease that are being uncovered. So this is a particularly concerning area as we see a huge rise in pediatric disease. And this appears to be at the root of a lot of it. 
This was just a study done not so long ago where they looked at cord blood. So the child is, you know, they take it right at birth and they found they tested for a few hundred chemicals. This was in the US. They also did a study in Quebec, same phenomenon, that the average child has multiple chemicals uh, in its system at birth reflecting what's going on in the fetal development. Two quick studies um, and then I will move to conclusion. This is a study that was published in JAM. Okay? And so what they looked here is women exposed to solvents. And what they found is that you know, these are people who are not drinking solvents, but they may work in factories, work with cleaning agents and stuff like that, who are breathing the stuff in. They found that those women working with solvents, their children were 13 times more likely to have major cardiac and major uh, neurological defects at birth. I recently saw a woman who found solvents in her. She has two children, both that had serious cardiac issues. One who's had three open hearts. But it doesn't stop just at birth. This is, look, this is a study in an epidemiology journal looking at pediatric cancer where the children died from age 1 to 15. And what they found is they looked at the birth uh, children that died over a 15-year period, so a long-term study, and where the mother was during the pregnancy. And they found that in every single case of pediatric of death, even at age 14 and 15, that the mother during the pregnancy lived in close proximity to certain specific industrial companies.